Hey there, everybody. We are continuing our conversation about our introduction to marketing analytics. And today we're going to be talking about the idea of a marketing model. And still, given this is more introductory material, it's mostly conceptual. I'll illustrate with some examples, but we're going to be at a high level view here while we're thinking about these things. Don't worry, we'll be getting into the weeds of marketing models and marketing analytics soon enough this semester. So first of all, what is a model? When we say the word model, we simply mean it's a simplified version of reality. Like literally when you think about what a model is in common language, it is always a simpli simplification of something real out there in the world. And we use models all the time in our lives, right? Like in relationships, uh, some people have some intuitive sort of if then rules about how dating operates about whether or not someone likes you. These are simplifications of reality, right? Little little simplification rules that make things easier to sort of uh, make decisions in the real world. Sports, similarly, like maybe if you're a baseball player and you uh, know what the count is, you can anticipate what the pitcher is going to throw or whatever sport we're talking about so you can also anticipate what your reaction should be. Or maybe even when it comes to weather, right? Um, for example, in San Diego, where many of us uh, are, we might just guess that it's always going to be sunny every single day, right? A simple model. Um, of course, sometimes we might be wrong. And no surprise, these simplifications of reality, right? Sort of ignoring a lot of other detail, hopefully less important detail, and focusing potentially on the things that matter the most uh, are thing, uh, is a thing that we also apply regularly in business. For example, if you heard a manager say something like, if I have below average sales for three months in a row, I know I'll have way above average sales the next month, unless my competitor has a big sale that same month. Notice here, it's a very simplified version of reality, right? This manager really is only looking at two things, sort of recent historical sales and their one competitor's sales activity to make an anticipation of what sales are going to look like um, in the near future. Obviously, many other factors come into play, but this, in fact, is a model. Now, why do we use models all the time? Well, since they're simplifications of reality, by definition, models are wrong, right? If we're reducing the complexity of the real world down to something that we can manage, we know that they won't always be perfectly right. But of course, that simplicity is exactly what also makes them useful to us, right? We can sort of get our head around it and really understand it. The other nice thing about models, and this is especially true in the world of computer aided model building that we most of us are sort of accustomed and assuming when we talk about models. It's a very easy to test hypothetical scenarios when you have models, right? You can plug in different inputs and sort of see how things change. The other nice thing about models is it does force our biases and subjective judgments. Sometimes I use the word vibes to illustrate this idea. Well, even if we are dealing with biases and subjective assessments, when we actually build a model, in most cases, at the very least, we at least have to make those biases and subjective assessments consistent to make the model work. Now, of course, we still have biases, but at the very least, we can now isolate them and hold them constant, which means we might be able to address them, improve upon them later. And then, of course, look, we're marketers, right? we're all about trying to influence consumer behavior, right? We do things, we do marketing stuff because we want to change how people behave. Well, we need models, a depiction of that relationship, what, what we do and how we think it'll change people's behavior in order, to act, in order to actually come up with a marketing game plan. So not all models, of course, are marketing models. There's all kinds of different models. Uh, here's an example of traffic flow, right? This is a computer simulation of traffic and to illustrate this idea that we use models to help understand how things work. Here we see we can control hypothetical traffic inflow, more vehicles coming. We can change the behavior of how cars follow one another. And we then can observe how congestion builds up under these different assumptions. Of course, actual traffic engineers use something a little more sophisticated than this to actually build our roadway systems, but this illustrates the idea. 
And in some cases, models aren't computer generated at all, right? For example, perhaps one of the more impressive ones here is the US Army Corps of Engineers San Francisco Bay model. You can actually go visit this if you ever visit the Bay Area. It's two acres wide. It is a real physical model that's meant to simulate the tides and the flow of the San Francisco Bay. Here's an example of a marketing model. So this model is designed to try to predict based on some input characteristics, whether or not a prospective customer is likely to sign up for our subscription service. So if we look on the left here, we'll see that there are some different lead categories. So if you're like a salesperson, you might have like a cool lead, hot lead, or warm lead. NPS score, this is an indicator of willingness to spread word of mouth. So this is something we might hypothetically know. We can toggle this. Maybe it's low. This person's not particularly willing to spread word of mouth. Platform usage, this is some measure maybe that we have about how engaged this individual is on our free portion of our online network. So perhaps they're very heavily engaged. And maybe we have some different customer segment types, some sort of internal system that we've already pre-built, some other marketers have done for us to sort of profile our different um, free users into different segments. And perhaps this person's in segment one. And it turns out if they're a warm lead, unlikely to really spread, uh, recommend or give word of mouth, but they're very active and they're in segment one, this model, remember there's math hiding underneath here, says there's a 99% chance that this type of person will subscribe. Great. If you're a salesperson, this would indicate if you happen to know these properties of a prospective person that you're trying to upsell to, you definitely would want to target them. Let me illustrate another example of a marketing model that was used in the real world. This comes from the telecom industry. So now, telecom companies obviously value customers differently, right? Some customers spend more money or more active, maybe have more lines that they're paying for than others. Um, maybe during the height of Pokemon Go back in the day, you heard about the so-called Pokemon Go grandpa. He had many, many, many phones running simultaneously um, so he could catch as many Pokemon as possible while he was traveling. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, an individual like this is particularly valuable to a company uh, since they have so many active lines. Of course, another way a telecom customer can be valuable is not through their individual purchases, right, or their individual subscriptions, but rather sometimes people refer valuable customers. In other words, a refer a fr friend program, right? So this might be a situation where somebody who is not uh, only has a single line maybe refers somebody to join this telecom company, and that person actually signs up for like three or four additional lines. Well, that makes the refer very valuable because of their word of mouth activity. So what this particular telecom company did was they built a model that predicted both the lifetime value of their customers. So this is the future earnings that are forecasted based on the actual purchase and shopping behaviors of the telecom customers. And then they also estimated so-called lifetime referral value. So this was a forecast of all the future word of mouth referrals that were estimated to be done by different uh, customers. So you take these two different dimensions of value and this company then segmented their customers into four buckets, so-called misers, affluence, champions, and advocates. So misers were basically those people who had relatively low lifetime value and they had low lifetime refer referral value. So they weren't worth a lot individually, nor were they likely to spread a lot of word of mouth. Advocates, on the other hand, relatively high word of mouth and referral activity, but not particularly valuable in of themselves through their behavior. Affluence, those are people who are individually very valuable, but were unlikely to spread a lot of referrals. And finally, there's, of course, the gold standard. Those are champions, individually very valuable through their uh, subscription, but also they were highly likely to spread word of mouth. Of course, all customers can be put into one of these four bins, but if you're the telecom company, once you segment them, clearly you kind of want to engage in marketing activities that migrate the customers to different groups. For the misers, 
we would love to see if we could uh, promote to them in such a way that moves them to any other segment. For the advocates, we'd like to turn them to champions. Affluents, also turn them to champions. And if they're already a champion, well, we're very happy for them to stay exactly where they are. So what did this marketer do now that they built a model that segmented these different individuals? Well, they actually engaged in a targeted marketing campaign for each of these segments. So the way they sent promotional mailers to each one of these groups was different. Of course, trying to stimulate different types of, of behavior. Their budget was about $4 per customer. And the result of this targeted marketing campaign to these different segments was a per customer profit increasing on average by $62. That's a heck of a return. Those percentages that you see below there in the grid shows the percentage of people in one segment that migrated to one of the other segments. So this is a very practical example how marketing models can aid in the practice of marketing. Now, another thing that we really have to be aware of as marketing um, analysts is that we as marketers are a little late to the game of using uh, input output models and other scientific and practitioner fields have started to develop their own terminology to describe models. So why is this important? This means that when you are out there in the world looking at so-called models, you have to be aware there's a series of synonyms that effectively mean, in most cases, the same thing, at least for our purposes. So for example, when we're talking about a marketing model, we might use the word model, math, statist a statistical model, algorithm, function, or equation, right? It's the stuff, the mathematical stuff that connects the input to the output. So be aware that any one of these words might be present. Also, the word marketing input is not always going to be the phrase that's going to be used. You might also see synonyms like input, predictor, independent variable, or IV, or simply X. And then more commonly, as data science and machine learning has grown as a field, the word feature. These are all words that when you see them present, your, your brain should fire off and say, oh, those are probably the inputs into the model, the things that are going into it. On the output side, so-called predicted outputs like sales, profitability, whether or not a customer buys, well, the other kind of words that you might see rather than predicted output are output, outcome, dependent variable, or DV, or simply why. Right? Some of these you might already recognize, and some of these might be a little less familiar. But it's important that we have the ability to understand, um, despite slightly different terms, we're typically talking about the same thing. Let me illustrate this by way of a seemingly complex example. So what in the world are we looking at right now? Well, what we're looking at right now is a neural network built in TensorFlow. What is TensorFlow? Well, TensorFlow is something that you probably, without realizing it, interact with almost every single day online. It's a end-to-end -end production grade machine learning platform. Uh, production grade meaning it is actually used to be deployed in the real world by enterprises and organizations who are using machine learning models in day-to-day -day, uh, business transactions. So this is called the TensorFlow Playground. If you Google that phrase, it'll take you to a little animated interface where you can actually see something like this and play with it. You can't break it, you can build it, and it's kind of fun. For now, for our purposes, when we look at this screen here, it might look a little intimidating at first, right? We see features, layers, outputs, and all kinds of dots and colors, and it's a little potentially confusing. But like I said, if we look carefully, we'll start to develop an ability to understand that this seemingly difficult to parse um, diagram is just an example of an input output model. So see the word feature in the upper left? Remember feature is synonymous with input or uh, X1 and X2. In this case, we have two features. Let's imagine that they are uh, household income and credit score, sort of concrete real things, right? Now on the far right side, we have our output. See those dots? In our case, since we're marketers, we might think of those dots as people. And let's say the blue dots represent uh, people who did buy our insurance product that we were selling. And the orange dots represent people who didn't 
buy our insurance product, right? So a purchase, no purchase decision. Now, finally, in the middle where you see it says two hidden layers, that's the neural network, aka the model, aka the mathematics. So those dotted flow lines that we're seeing here, those are math equations, right? So if we take these synonyms and map them back on to this chart, we can start seeing um, it's much more understandable, right? We see income and credit score flowing into the model. And then on the output here, we have a little scatter plot with income and credit score on the X and Y axes. So we can see here in the bottom left, there's individuals who have high uh, income but low credit score. Uh, in the upper left here, we have people who have low income but a high credit score and so on. Now the outcome was whether they did or didn't buy the color dots. And finally, remember the model or the math is depicted here two ways. One by those dotted flow lines, that's a neural network in action. But what does the neural network actually do? Well, it creates these colors. Do you see the orange triangles and the blue sort of stripe in the middle? Well, that's the prediction. That's what the model ultimately does. It makes a prediction. In other words, from the model's perspective, anybody who falls into that orange region, the model would always guess that that person wouldn't buy the insurance. And according to the mathemat this particular mathematical model, anybody who fell into the blue region, any new dot that was added, the model would predict that they would buy. Now, of course, whenever you see the color of the dot match the background color, that's an example of a correct prediction, right? The model correctly predicted what the person did. But of course, the model wasn't always right, and that's always the case with marketing models. We never presume that we can predict uh, human behavior perfectly, right? So we make some failed predictions. So don't worry, we are not going to be building too many neural networks but these are the things that you're going to be exposed to in your sort of day-to-day -day marketing world and uh, in, in your career. So it's important that we have at least an ability to sort of sense and identify them. And sure enough, our advertising analytics 2.0 diagram is just yet another example of an input output model, as is our marketing response modeling framework, right? We have an input output model here. Okay. So with all this talk about the ability to identify models, the different terms that we might be using, their applications, like do models really, really matter, right? Is it worth it to us as marketers to spend all this time building and using models? I mean, for many of us, we like to think we have a little bit of inherent genius when it comes to marketing, right? We, we get it ourselves, right? We think we know. It is entirely true through repeated, repeated amounts of empirical evidence that most times when people think prediction models or input output models can't really be used to predict uh, human behavior, they're wrong. In fact, I mean, we can go in all kinds of different fields like medical diagnosis, loan granting, and of course, marketing. Even really, really simple input output models almost always tend to outperform complete expert judgment. In other words, vibes. In fact, even models that don't have data, meaning if you literally just take people's expert judgments and you write down their logic of how they're making those assessments and you build a model based on nothing but that, even those types of models called subjective models tend to outperform just raw expert judgments. This alludes back to a point I made in the beginning of our conversation where even if you have biases and judgments in a model, at least they're held constant. And typically, it appears that when you hold those, con those constant, experts' judgments actually improve. Now, we can't just leap to the conclusion that models are always more effective, right? Just because you built a model doesn't mean you necessarily built a good model. So how exactly do we make such an assessment? Like, how do we know when models are considered good or poor? Well, let's look at an example here from uh, the data journalism website, 538. Here's what they say. Forecasts, which are things that are generated from input output models, 
have always been a core part of 538's mission. They force us, and you, to think about the world probabilistically, rather than in absolutes. And making predictions improves our understanding of the world by testing our knowledge of how it works. Right, input-output models make predictions. Now, one of the things that 538 does is they make an enormous number of predictions related to sports outcomes. Like, they basically predict who is going to win every single upcoming Major League Baseball game, basketball game, football game, hockey game, and so on. So what we're looking at here is a diagram that takes all of their predictions over history. Notice that there's some blue dots kind of chasing along that dotted line. What do these blue dots represent? Let's just focus on one. Notice that that dot's about at 75% for forecast and 71% for what actually happened. Here's how we interpret that. Inside that dot basically represents 28,529 observations. In other words, that's how many forecasts for um, games that 530 has made, made since its inception, where approximately they had a 40, I'm sorry, 75% forecast of something happening. So say the, uh, the Warriors uh, beating the Chicago Bulls uh, on any given particular year, maybe there was a one particular game where they said they have a 75% chance of winning. Well, across those 28,000 plus times, if they said something had a 75% chance of happening, well, that means they will be wrong sometimes. In fact, they should be wrong exactly 25% of the time, right? They should be correct 75% of the time because that's what their forecast was, a 75% chance. And what you can see here is an assessment of how well their model is calibrated. They said things had a 75% chance of happening, but they actually happened 71% of the time. It'd be perfect if it was 75 and 75. So there's a little difference there. But overall, and you can notice those blue dotted, uh, those blue circles are matching right up against that dotted line. That indicates that 538 has a very well calibrated model. Things tend to happen as often as it predicts it's going to happen. So this is one of the ways that in the long run, we can assess whether or not our models are good. And one of the things that we should keep in mind here is when we say good model is we're not saying a model is always going to be correct. That's basically impossible. Rather, what we really want are models that are really well calibrated. They're accurate with their uncertainty. So if we were building a customer prediction model, like trying to predict which customers will or will not buy, say, um, an insurance product from us, for all of the customers that we predict, say, have a 90% chance of buying, well, kind of following the exact same logic here as 538 did, well, if we say there's a 90% chance, if we look at all of those customers, say, in a year, 90% of them should have bought our insurance product and 10% shouldn't have. That would mean that our predictions are accurate. Similarly, for the customers that we said there was a 50-50 chance of them signing up, a year later when we assess the numbers, we should see exactly that. 50% of them did in fact buy our product and 50% did not. In other words, when we're trying to identify the best model, what we really do is we make concrete predictions based on that model of what we think is going to happen in the real world. Then we observe what really happened. And of course, the closer of what we predict is to what really does occur, that means we minimize our error, right? And I hope that follows basic intuition. Good models are those that generally make predictions that are close to reality. Oh yeah. And we also have a preference for simple model models rather than complex ones. And what do I mean by complexity? In most cases, that literally just means mathematical complexity. Look at these two examples of models. There's a linear model on the left and a neural network model on the right. Which one would you characterize as being simpler? I hope you pick the one on the left. And sure enough, we also have a preference when we pick models and identify good models, we like to keep it simple as well. We only chase after complexity when it absolutely drastically improves our prediction performance. And that's good news for us as marketing analysts. It turns out 
in our field, very simple models actually can outperform overly or needlessly complex models. So consider there's this paper from Green and Armstrong in 2015 about sales forecasting. What they did was they compared basic sales forecasts. So imagine all the different things that a, a company normally does to anticipate what sales are going to be in the next year, next quarter, and so on. Some of those forecast models are very, very, very simple, very basic. Some can be ridiculously complex. They directly compared simple versus complex sales forecast models and then observed, well, which one was right or which one had less error more often. And what they found was that model complexity actually increased the error of sales forecasts. In other words, adding more complex math didn't improve the forecast. It actually made it worse. We've actually found this to be true in other fields as well, like clinical drug trials, like trying to test to see which medicine or which vaccines are more or less effective. Uh, researchers in that, in that field found that there was no performance benefit for using machine learning over simple logistic regression. Uh, for now, if you're not sure what logistic regression is, just trust me when I say it's a simpler mathematical form than most machine learning models. Okay, so now, let's th now that I hopefully have motivated you to believe that models are really important and we have some intuition about how we assess which models are good or poor, well, if models matter, that would imply that we often need to communicate models to one another in the marketing field. How do we do that? The most common ways that we usually depict models and to communicate them are simple verbal, box and arrow, graphics or visuals, mathematical or spreadsheet models. Let's go back to our earlier example of the Bluetooth speaker enabled fanny pack to sort of situate our thinking here. And let's imagine that we are trying to understand how some marketing activities, inputs, will impact our sales, our total sales of our Bluetooth enabled fanny packs. Well, here's an example of a simple verbal model. Increasing the number of jammy pack styles will start to drastically increase total sales but only up to a point. Also, if we increase the amount of money on banner advertising for the jammy pack, we won't see any benefit until people see the ad several times. Look, it's just a couple sentences, but right inside of that, can you identify the input parts of the, of the model? Can you detect the output part of the model? And of course it's imprecise because we're using just words, but can you see the mathematical part or the thing how do we think those two things are connected, I should say. Now, another way that we would, might commonly communicate this is a simple box and arrow diagram, right? These are our inputs. This stuff causes that stuff. Very simple, right? Easy, easy way to quickly communicate our ideas of cause and effect or model to other marketers. Now, adding a little graphical depiction can improve uh, quite a bit more dramatically, right? On the x-axis, we have number of styles in the upper left there, total sales on the y-axis. And for banner ad impressions, on the x-axis in the bottom left, that's our input, our other input, and total sales. And I have a little question mark pointing at that um, slow S part of the S-shaped curve. Like, why is it there? Well, if you recall what the individual said with their theory about sales was they thought it was going to take a while for the banner ads to um, be effective, right? People had to be exposed multiple times. So that would make sense that at first, as you increase banner ad impressions, total sales, at least you're anticipating, won't go up. Now, the big major disadvantage of all these previous approaches is that it's imprecise, right? It's easy to use our words, easy to show a hypothetical picture or a diagram. That's wonderful. It's a great place to start. But the big issue is the lack of precision. We never actually said this many styles causes this much sales this many banner ads cause this many sales. So that brings us where we want to introduce some mathematical precision. Notice how I have taken the sort of visual depiction and now we actually have a mathematical model. In that blue section here, we could push in a number, right? Simply type in whatever number of styles and that'll help us make a precise prediction for our uh, result in sales. Similarly, here's our math equation for the number of ads and the impact on sales. Now, a very reasonable thing to wonder right now is like, well, why are these equations what they are? Like, why are those numbers there? 
And that's fine. For now, we are just assuming that these equations were handed above from on high. Someone else built good mathematical equations and gave them to us. What we need to appreciate here is that we have a lot of precision now, right? We can make really precise um, forecasts now that we actually have a mathematical model. And here's a multivariate example. Notice that we have a number of styles uh, running in the columns and then banner impressions in tens of thousands running in the rows. Inside colored red, tan, and green, these are our sales figures. In other words, again, somebody from on high, not us, built a mathematical model. There's math underneath here. And now by plugging in different style numbers and banner ad impressions into this equation here on the right, the bottom right hand side, we can actually see the resulting sales. So we can actually see the interplay between two or more variables. And in this case, at least as far as increasing sales is concerned, ignoring cost, we clearly want to maximize the number of styles and want to maximize the number of banner ad impressions. So pedal to the metal, at least according to this math, a mathematical model. So this brings us to the conclusion of our conversation here today. It is in fact necessary for us to impose a precise mathematical form between marketing actions and expected outcomes if we want to apply marketing analytics principles, right? We cannot figure out how to improve our marketing actions without a mathematical model that connects the two. Now, luckily for us, we're going to be using just a few basic building blocks to introduce this idea of how we ourselves can build connections between inputs and outputs. So it is indeed math o'clock for us already.